Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Jay Singh, and I will be moderating today. Thank you, uh, Sean Sullivan, for hosting this webinar, and thank you for everyone who took time out of the schedules to attend. Our panelists today are Jessica Caney, who will be speaking about the fabricating printable electronics biosen and biosensor chips technology. Gregory Doré, who will be speaking about the modular artificial gravity orbital refinery spacecraft technology and Don Ellerby, who will be speaking on the heat shield for extreme entry environment technology, also known as heat. Following the technology presentations, I will be giving a short presentation on how to license uh, these NAS technologies. Before we get started, I'd like to point out that your microphones will be muted throughout this presentation. So if you have any questions, please type them into the chat box and we will answer them during the Q&A session at the end. At this point, I will hand it over to Jessica and share her slides. All right, well, thank you, Jay. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for the, the uh, invitation to speak to all of you today. Um, again, my name is Jessica Caney. Um, I'm a scientist at NASA Ames Research Center. Um, and today I'm gonna talk to you about fabricating printable uh, electronics and biosensors chips. Next slide, please. So I'll start a little bit with our, our uh, motivation for this work. Um, and first, I want to kind of direct your attention towards the International Space Station. The International Space Station is really where, where human spaceflight exists right now. Um, and, and there's um, quite a few um, hardware uh, failures that occur uh, really on an annual basis. This is something that's constantly happening is that, that things break um, and, and need to be replaced. Um, what I'm showing you here is a pie chart that, that categorizes um, all of these different hardware failures in, ter in terms of what kind of components we're talking about. Um, and as you can see, um, two of the biggest slices of this pie are in the electrical and electronic area, as well as, as uh, plastics and composites. I'm gonna talk to you about, about printed electronics. And so um, this, this slide highlights kind of um, um, a little bit of the motivation for, for why we're, we're getting to work in this area. Um, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so if we also look at, at the International Space Station in terms of how, how we logistically support uh, the, the human crew that, that exist on, on the humans um, or on the ISS, um, we can look at um, it in terms of, of uh, a mass of spare parts that, that the ISS will, will carry or spare parts that we'll just have uh, um, at our disposal to, to go and repair and replace these things that, that, that break. Um, and so each of these uh, on the International Space Station, we're showing um, spare parts in terms of a mass um, shown as green squares up above. And so there's a high redundancy of everything that we need to operate so that when something goes wrong, something breaks, we can then swap it out with something that we already have there and ready to go. Um, and then there's, there's a down mass associated with when we get rid of the, the thing that broke, and that's showing us as a, as a red square. And then you'll see all of these um, kind of orange yellow squares that we have uh, currently on the ground. And that's a, another redundancy of, of spare parts um, that we, we have here on earth that we have um, stored and ready to go. And so once something fails on the International Sp Space Station, they've got to take from their spare parts that they're carrying along with them. Now we've got to go um, and launch um, um, you know, additional spare parts to kind of replace their spare parts, if you will. Um, and so there's this constant kind of up and down um, uh, um, that we're doing uh, of these spare parts uh, just to sustain uh, the, the laboratory functions as, as well as the, the humans um, on, on that lab. Um, so um, what we're looking at is we're looking at, at um, you know, additional uh, ways um, and methods to get around this um, um, kind of mode of operation where, where um, we're constantly needing to, to shuttle, if you will, spare parts, you know, back and forth to where humans are. Um, so let's go to the next slide. And so, so one way to do this, and, and what my lab is, is um, working on, is this idea of bringing manufacturing capabilities um, to the space environment. And we call this in-space manufacturing or ISM. And I apologize, I may just call out ISM in the future. We love our acronyms at NASA. 
and um, and this is what I'm talking about in space manufacturing. Um, so let me direct your attention to the the um, image that's on the the top right. Um, right now we're we're um, operating as this kind of earth reliant um, kind of operation where where we're uh, utilizing the the International Space Station. We're moving things back and forth. Oops. Uh, let's go back one slide. Oh, oh, a couple slides. There we go. Um, and and we're we're um, also demonstrating um, some of these these manufacturing uh, techniques um, um, on the the uh, International Space Station uh, that we can use for in space manufacturing. Um, eventually, humans um, in the actually very near future. Um, we are moving um, to the moon, and the moon is going to be our, our kind of proving ground for a lot of this manufacturing capability um, to see if we can actually not be reliant on Earth anymore and really have what we need, uh, you know, on board, um, you know, uh, vehicle, habitation, what have you. Um, and all of this proving ground on the moon is really designed um, for, for um, Earth-independent uh, space travel. Uh, being um, um, the Mars um, mission, human humans to Mars, um, and so there's kind of three three uh, mission critical components of ISM. Um, first, we really need to optimize uh, the resources that that we we use, whether we bring them, whether we we take them from where we are. Uh, we need to decrease uh, dependence on supply chain, decrease our dependence really on Earth here. Um, and and um, also overall decreasing on launch costs as we get away from these earth reliant um, kind of way of, of bringing things or, or uh, uh, re replacing um, you know broken components uh, this this will will um, also help us decrease these launch costs um, there's there's a couple of, of key features for for um, ISM we we really want these manufacturing capabilities to be automated we don't want to rely um, or, or have our, our uh, human crew having to do a lot of things, you know, that, that we wanted these to, to be largely um, independent of a lot of, of crew time. Um, we, we'd like um, them to, to um, have, have our, uh, the ability to be highly tailorable. Um, and so we don't know exactly what problems uh, may come uh, forward. We'd like to just um, have have uh, capabilities that that can can be applied to um, solve a lot of different problems, um, and of course uh, we want minimal waste generation. We just don't um, have a lot of room um, for for anything, um, and so the the more that we can use and reuse and and not generating a lot of waste um, is the way that we want to go. Um, let's move to the next slide. So the the in space manufacturing or ISM project portfolio. This is a large project that. Is strewn across um, uh, several NASA centers, um, small businesses, academic partners. It's it's actually a very very large uh, area of research, um, and so I've I've kind of highlighted um, a lot of what's going on at NASA just in case there's there's other things that this audience is interested in. These are are all areas that that we are um, um, investigating right now. Um, my research um, focuses on the printed electronics area, um, and that's what I'm going to. Uh, talk to you about in the next slide. So let's go to the next one. All right. Now um, let's get into to um, uh, a, a very specific NASA um, application, and that is revolving around human spaceflight um, and the impacts that human spaceflight have on the human body. Um, and so I'm sure that you've all heard, you know, microgravity, high radiation, confined living environment. Um, there, there's a number of, of, of kind of physiological like ailments and, you know, um, there, there's a lot of things that, that can come up. Um, bone bone uh, density loss is, of course, probably the one that people hear about the most, muscle atrophy. Um, there's cardiovascular um, um, concerns. Um, and so um, there, for, for many of these ailments, uh, we have um, molecular markers, biomarkers um, that, that can be monitored um, in real time to, to give us an assessment of how these systems are performing and, and therefore um, how healthy the astronaut crew is at the time of the mission. Um, what we're looking for um, going forward is getting more of these markers. We need in-flight point of care diagnostic capability. And so currently while we're on, on the space station, we're doing a lot of 
Um, we do some monitoring um, of the astronauts in real time um, during flight, but we also take samples and do the analysis on the ground. We want to bring more of that analysis um, with us um, and, and uh, performed, um, whether it's on the International Space Station or some other vehicle or habitation environment. Um, and so, so that's what my, my uh, lab focuses on is the development of additional in-flight point of care diagnostics. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, and so this is, slide is showing you kind of two examples of, of in-flight uh, medical uh, devices that have been used in the past and kind of where we're going in the future. Um, and so in the past, what I'm showing you here is, is from the Apollo mission, and it's a suite of biomedical sensors that, that the Apollo astronauts uh, wore to do, do quite, quite a bit of monitoring. Um, and what you can see is this, this data was, of course, very, very helpful, um, but um, it also, uh, there's quite a few wires, uh, a lot of things to be worn. This is a wearable device uh, sensor suite. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of things that can get caught. Um, but you can see that wearing this could be quite cumbersome to the crew. Um, and so we're, we're trying to develop things that, that are um, easier to wear, not cumbersome, don't get in the way of operational missions. And, and one such prototype is what I'm showing you here on the right hand side, and this is called AstroSense. Um, this is just a prototype image right here. Um, this is a project between multiple NASA centers as well as Nextflex as an industry uh, partner. Um, and it's a wearable Band-Aid style uh, uh, sensor. Um, and um, okay, so to, to um, oops, okay, let's go to the next slide. Perfect. Okay, so to make make these sensors, um, my lab is is designing electrochemical biosensors, and we're printing electronic materials to make these these biosensors. And so I'm showing you um, three different printer capabilities that we use, um, and these are all ground based printers that we're prototyping with at the moment. And so the first is this precision micro dispense. I'm showing you here the Enscript printer uh, prints a wide range of viscosity inks. These are all thin film printers. Um, and you can see there's kind of two components that are being printed in that image right there. That's a three electrode electrochemical sensor it's printing. Um, we're also evaluating inkjet. Inkjet um, um, prints uh, lower viscosity inks. Uh, these are kind of piezo drop on demand uh, um, um, style printers uh, to print conductive uh, dielectric semiconductive uh, inks. And I'm showing you um, one, one prototype example there. Um, I also wanted to, to mention we, we um, do some aerosolized um, printing, and one, one in particular is this plasma jet. Um, this is actually a NASA innovation um, from my lab that was spun off into a company that's called Space Foundry um, that prints an, an, an aerosolized low viscosity ink um, that is, is printed out of a small nozzle uh, with an atmospheric um, pressure plasma. This is a cold plasma. Um, that's used to, to print materials uh, with. Um, and one thing that's kind of nice about this printer is that um, we have um, the ability to kind of tune the chemistry environment just because we have this um, plasma. We can change the gases and some, some of the um, um, plasma parameters to, to tune the, the chemical environment while we print. Um, let's go to the next slide. So I wanna give you one example here. This is a, a, an example of, of a printed biosensor with our micro dispensed uh, printer. Um, the image on the left-hand side shows you the three different um, uh, electrochemical electrodes. Two of them are carbon. Um, one, the kind of brighter dot on the right-hand side, that's a silver silver chloride reference electrode. Um, and this is being designed as a, a wearable sensor. And so, um, we, we want this sensor to be worn over a long period of time, and so we have a stability test. This is a, a typical electrochemical assay, and we're just um, cycling um, um, this redox uh, reaction um, over several hours. And we're, we're showing that, that um, we do have a little bit of drift to, you know, um, from 2 to 20 hours, but we're still very much able to resolve the peaks with, with no degradation of the, the um, uh, signal. Um, as well as the redox kinetics are, are maintained. So we're, we're happy with this. Um, and then I'm giving you an example of some stress marker um, um, uh, biomarkers that can be detected directly in sweat. And that's what we're doing with this project right now. And so this is showing epinephrine detection, which can be detect detected straight out of sweat. And the, the different um, colors of these plots are showing different concentration ranges. And so this is showing a wide um, 
uh, kind of operational uh, window, uh, if you will, for, for epinephrine detection. Let's, let's go to the next slide. Um, so there's uh, additional applications. I really focused here on the kind of human human health side. Um, and, and right now we're looking at these stress biomarkers. We've got a project for bone health, another one for muscle health. We've worked heart health in the past. Um, there's also environmental uh, mental monitoring capability that can come out of this type of technology. And we've done this in the past um, for looking at pathogen detection, even heavy metal detection, salt detection. Um, and so this is, I, I just kind of wanted to show you the kind of wide breadth of, of what this, this type of platform can be used, uh, um, used for. And then in terms of fluids that, that we can introduce to it, you know, of course, we're working on sweat, urine, we've worked on blood. Uh, we can take ocean samples, pond samples, water samples, potable water sam uh, samples. Um, that also can be configured in a number of different ways. And that's what I've showed you on the left-hand side. We configured... Uh, this electrochemical sensor is a lateral flow assay. This is very much like your rapid antigen test of these COVID-19 um, uh, tests that we're unfortunately all too familiar with these days. Um, this one, instead of a colorimetric readout, it has the electrochemical uh, electrical readout. Um, and then I showed one example of a handheld reader. Um, there's a number of commercial handheld readers that we use um, um, for, for our, our projects and missions. Um, this is just one of them. Um, shown here. And let's go to the last slide and just wrap up. Um, I mentioned this is a project is mainly NASA Ames research, um, but the, the um, uh, printing of electronics project is led out of NASA Marshall. Our, our um, um, lead is Curtis Hill over there, as well as the data of what I shared with you is, is, is heavily collaborative with, with NextFlex on this project um, and a couple of um, funding, um, NASA internal funding um, right there. Um, with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Jessica. That was very informative, very, very interesting. And uh, next up, we have uh, Gregory Duray, and he'll be talking about the modular artificial gravity orbital refinery spacecraft uh, technology. And I'll be sharing his slides in just a second. Take it away. Uh, okay. Thank you, Jay. Uh, and I'm Greg Duray, I'm an intelligence systems research scientist at the NASA Ames Research Center for the last 25 years. Today I'll be discussing the modular artificial gravity orbital refinery spacecraft technology I've been working on. I'll start by unpacking this title, then describe why somebody might find this technology of value and how it works. The content of this talk is summarized in the fact sheet at the technology.nasa.gov uh, website link shown in the title page uh, for your future reference. Five elements of the title are modular, artificial gravity, orbital, refinery, and spacecraft. And I'll summarize each element in reverse order. This entire system is a spacecraft consisting of a set of integrated spacecraft. In that sense, it can be viewed as a type of space station, which I'll describe in more detail. Its primary purpose is to refine uh, raw materials from asteroids and the moons, uh, Mars moons, Phobos, and Deimos, which, unlike the Earth's moon, have almost no gravity. It can uh, also be used to recycle orbiting space debris, which are rich in metals that can relatively easily be refined compared to obtaining refined metals from asteroids. More on this later. The spacecraft is designed to operate in orbit where artificial gravity is needed. It could work on the Earth, Moon, and Mars, but since they generate their own gravity and rotate relatively slowly, this technology would not be as useful as on orbit. Unlike any spacecraft deployed to date, this spacecraft generates significant levels of artificial gravity. People have talked about such spacecraft for decades, but there are challenges that I will discuss. And so if you get anything out of this talk, I hope a better understanding of managing a spacecraft that generates artificial gravity is it. Uh, Jay, could you go two slides ahead? There we go. Uh, this technology is inherently modular. Uh, the International Space Station is modular in the sense that it was assembled in modules. However, once these modules were assembled, they really weren't designed to eas easily um, be separated. In the technology we will discuss, uh, most of the modules are attached by the means of docking ports, such that the modules can be replaced as needed, like spacecraft docking and dunk undocking with the International Space Station. Okay, let's dig a little deeper. Before I discuss the spacecraft, it should be clear on the overall size is entirely scalable. A small-scale prototype could fit on a desktop and be launched as a secondary payload. 
A larger version could be a primary payload of a launch vehicle unfold or assembled on orbit. Or the most practical version for refinery operations is that each module is either the upper stage of a launch vehicle or actually is the upper stage um, of a launch vehicle. I was on the proposal team and one of the developers of the L-Cross spacecraft, which consisted of the Atlas V Centaur upper stage and its payload adapter that was developed into a shepherding spacecraft. The spacecraft uh, then guided the Centaur stage to impact the moon, uh, south pole of the moon in 2009. The same design could be used to dock a module with this spacecraft instead. Perhaps this spacecraft can be best understood as a vertical space station consisting of three rotating rings, uh, which are shown each having three horizontal modules uh, to it. The size and shape of each module is flexible, but it is important that there are three modules per ring, which I'll explain later. Each horizontal module attaches to its rings by means of a docking port and can either uh, uh, by spacecraft uh, or, or, or stages that dock to spacecraft. The rings are stacked on a base that can be mounted on the surface of whatever is getting raw materials from, such as a asteroid, or it can be free flying in space. Raw materials enter the base from the bottom by means of a boring machine or other spacecraft. Um, there is a vertical passage through the stack from the bottom to the top, so materials can be transferred between each module. At the top of the spacecraft is a multi-purpose transfer vehicle, which can be used to transfer the entire spacecraft to where it needs to go, as well as undock and dock with each individual module to transfer them as well uh, as needed as well. Uh, so that describes the major elements. Let's uh, discuss how it works. When it comes to artificial gravity, the three most important things to keep in mind are angular momentum, conservation of angular momentum, and moment of inertia. The earliest spacecraft were spin stabilized. This spinning resulted in angular momentum that resisted any change in orientation uh, other than the constant rotation rate along its spin axis. This is basically how a gyroscope works. If you don't want to change its axis of rotation, this works great. But if you do, this is a problem due to the second point, conservation of angular momentum. In space, propellant is needed to change a spacecraft's orientation because angular momentum is conserved. There are exceptions, such as when operating in a magnetic field or a solar wind, or when angular momentum is stored in rotating wheels, but it is generally true. If an astronaut is floating in space and they don't have a jetpack to move around with, no matter how hard they try to twist and turn, they can't even turn around. This is due to the conservation of angular momentum. If they started spinning when they pushed off from a spacecraft, no matter how they try, they won't be able to stop spinning. Again, propellant can be used to solve this problem, However, for a spacecraft that generates a lot of artificial gravity, this can take a lot of propellant. And the propellant is mass that increases the propellant required to change orientation, just like a launch vehicle needs more propellant to lift the propellant it needs. So, and once you're out of propellant, you're stuck with the angular momentum you have. The third point is the moment of inertia. This is essentially the resistance an object has to changing its rotation rate. Think of two disks that both have the same mass. And same diameter, but for one, almost all of its mass is located in the center, and the other disk, almost all of its mass is located on its rim. It will take much less effort to change the rotation rate of the disk with most of its weight in the center than the disk with most of its weight in the rim. This is because even though the masses of both objects are the same, the moments of inertia for both objects are significantly different. Ice skaters use converse, uh, conservation of angular momentum and their moment of inertia to their advantage when they spin. By sticking their arms out, they increase their moment of inertia and consequently reduce their spin rate. And by bringing their arms in, they decrease their moment of inertia and increase their spin rate with no other effort on their part. The other thing in, to keep in mind is what happens when the moment of inertia center point is not on its axis of rotation. What would happen if a skater just brought in one arm but leave the other arm extended? This is why people take their cars in to get their tires balanced. Perhaps a better example of uh, what happens to a washing machine where the load is not evenly balanced. It can wobble pretty badly, and generally this wobble is not beneficial. Let's apply these issues to the spacecraft and how this technology resolves them. The spacecraft maintains a zero angular momentum, so propellant is not required to spin up or spin down the artificial gravity rings as needed. If the spacecraft were mounted on an asteroid and had significant amount of angular momentum, it would fight against the rotation of the asteroid and could possibly 
ripped the base away from the asteroid, if not mounted much more strongly than needed, if it had uh, no angular momentum. The spacecraft accomplishes this by counter-rotating counter two rings. Each ring can have uh, considerable angular momentum, but because they are coupled and the angular momentum signs are opposite, uh, so when they are summed, they negate each other. The moments of inertia of each ring can be different and continually changing as mass moves through their modules, which happens in the refining process. However, in order for the rotation rate uh, to consequently the artificial gra gravity to remain constant, when the moment of inertia changes, the angular momentum has to go somewhere uh, so this ring spin rate doesn't change like the ice skater when they move their arms. This is where the third ring comes in. This ring has modules primarily for storage, standby, and otherwise um, not uh, sensitive to the, what the spin rate of that ring is. This ring can also spin up so that one of the other rings can be stopped to replace one of its hor horizontal modules. The other feature of the, of the modules on these rings, they move uh, as the mass of the material being processed move along through their modules. By two of the three module docks moving along the circumference of their ring, the moment of inertia center point is kept on the axis of rotation. So the overall spacecraft does not wobble like an unbalanced washing machine. What happens inside each module is entirely up to the user of the module. It can take in, uh, it can input raw materials from the body um, the spacecraft is mounted to, such as an asteroid, or it can take its inputs from the outputs of other modules, as in this is common in the refinery pro uh, process, where each subsystem in the process focuses on refining different material inputs and producing different material outputs. Because the modules are subject to artificial gravity, they can be adjusted to whatever level is needed, as is in the centrifuge, heat convection works as it does on Earth. With molten fluids and gases, the less dense substances rise toward the hub, and the denser substances sink away from it, such as in a smelter extracting metal from ore. Models can be used to create silicon wafers for solar panels or coils of wire for welding and 3D printing, as well as extrude long beams out of the end of the module that are cut off at the desired length and use as needed. In this sense, the entire spacecraft can be viewed as a type of industrial park. As the capabilities of the system become well-established, replacement modules and eventually entire spacecraft can be re reproduced in situ with the potential to exponentially increase the materials being refined. Uh, can you go back a slide, Jay? Yeah, this is the, uh, um, sums up the, what we discussed here, uh, uh, the features and benefits and I invite you to ask questions. Thanks. Thank you. That was that was very very informative. Very interesting uh, to see how uh, all that works. And so uh, next up, uh, we have our final presenter, Don Ellerby, and uh, he'll be talking about um, a woven uh, thermal protection system technology, uh, which is a heat shield for extreme entry environment technology, also known as heat. Don, take it away. All right. Thanks, Jay. Um, and thanks, everyone, for joining uh, this afternoon. Uh, my name is Don Ellerby, as Jay said, uh, and I was going to talk to you a bit generally about woven thermal protection systems overall. It's kind of a, if you can consider it a family of thermal protection systems, and then really narrow down into the heat technology and what it was for. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Um, at Ames, we've been sort of working on this 3D woven thermal protection system development since um, early 2011. So about 10 years now. Um, it, it was actually evolved from a, a separate technology that was known as ADEPT, um, which was looking at a sort of flexible, deployable type heat shield, consider a, an umbrella, uh, and uh, 3D woven carbon materials that were used to go between the struts of the umbrella. Um, but in this case, trying to adapt it for use on um, uh, rigid aero shells uh, for um, you know, typical entry missions. Um, and it was really targeting for high heat flux missions, such as the outer planets, um, Jupiter, Saturn, the ice giants, or at Venus, or very high speed sample return missions to Earth. Um, and as we were sort of working through that, um, uh, there was a sort of subset of this technology um, known as 3D Woven Multifunctional Ablative TPS, or 3D MAT for short. Um, 
which I'll talk about in the next slide, but was used on Orion. So the next uh, crewed spacecraft uh, for taking astronauts uh, to the moon, um, a particular application for that. Um, but the, the primary focus and what I'll talk about today was under the heat shield for extreme entry technology, environment technology or heat. Um, uh, this um, and maturing this to the point where missions would be able to adopt it. Um, we were incentivized in one of the recent Discovery and New Frontiers announcement of opportunities. Uh, and then also a, a sub, if you want to call it a derivative of the heat technology is actually the baseline um, heat shield thermal protection system for the Mars sample return uh, mission. Uh, so if we can go to the next slide. So before diving into heat, um, I just wanted to take a moment to talk a little bit about 3D mat. And I think at one of these uh, previous technology forums, um, Jay Feldman discussed 3D mat in more depth. But for those of you who may not have seen that, I just wanted to touch on that for a minute. Um, so this is a 3D woven um, quartz cyanide ester composite material. Um, it's fully densified, so it's a fully dense um, 3D composite, in this case with orthogonal um, uh, fibers in the Z direction. Uh, and its application was initially for what we call a compression pad. Uh, and so if you look at the stack up in the sort of top left quadrant there, uh, on launch, the crew module and service module are attached to each other. Um, uh, and with a, a tension tie, they call it, that goes through there, pulls them together, but that imposes a considerable compressive stress onto the bottom side of the crew module onto the primary heat shield there. Uh, and so your typical thermal protection system, you might use like the mid density material on the rest of the acreage of the crew module um, heat shield, which is Avcoat, um, can't take that kind of load. Um, so we needed a material that could structurally capable of handling those compression compressive loads, um, hence it was called a compression pad, and at the same time manage the thermal environment during entry. Um, and so uh, a lot of us would cut our teeth um, at NASA working on Orion early on. Uh, we understood the challenges with the compression pad that was being used on the first launch EFT-1 and recognized that that wasn't going to be suitable for a lunar return type environment. Um, EFT-1 was only a, a LEO type environment return. And so we were able to leverage that understanding of the problem um, to turn around a solution based on the sort of 3D woven technology in roughly three to four years. Um, it had to take considerable structural load and then earth entry return environments of up to about a thousand watts per square centimeter. Uh, and so hence the term multifunctional ablative thermal protection system. Um, at the top right gives a, on the on the far right gives a, an image of what the compression pad looks like it's about 11 inches in diameter in the center there is then the tension tie which got an explosive bolt that be, is able to cut it so not only did you have to take the compressive loads um of the service module and compression module being detached but you also had to survive the the, the shock from the explosive bolt going off um it was uh it was very successful in terms of being adopted by Orion. And so all the compression pads are using 3D mat. And in fact, um, there are multiple regions around the vehicle that were using a 2D carbon phenolic that wanted to replace that with the 3D mat, uh, such as the umbilical interface plate that's shown there in the top right image there. Um, and so, you know, it was uh, uh, significantly successful. It replaced all, basically, almost all of the 2D laminated carbon phenolic on the vehicle. Um, it's about nine times the inner laminar strength that you had for the 2D carbon phenolic. So you get these Z fibers going through bridging between the layers. Uh, it's about 40% higher compressive strength, and it's about 30% lower in the thermal conductivity by replacing those carbon fibers with the glass fibers. Um, so anyways, that, that was just touching on 3D mat, um, but now if we can go to the next slide, I'll try to go into the, the meat of the presentation for today. Um, so what was motivating for us to look for uh, for, for heat, for, for starting that? Um, and, and it was really a shortfall in the currently existing um, thermal protection system materials uh, available for NASA missions. And the, the figure here, we're kind of plotting the heat flux versus stagnation pressure during entry. Um, and on there, we've got 
you know, little red triangles for a variety of the different missions that exist that, that we've flown in the past. Um, and within the parentheses then is the sort of total mass uh, percentage of the entry mass associated with that, that, those missions. And what you can kind of see is we had materials for the range from maybe a thousand watts per square centimeter or lower one atmosphere pressure or lower um, right around where Stardust and Genesis, uh, you know, Apollo were. There were existing materials for there. And then if you had really, really extreme entry emissions like Pioneer Venus and Galileo, fully dense carbon phenolic TD is what we'd been used in the past. Um, but in between, um, there was kind of this gap where uh, mission designs were going through finding a need for these sort of intermediate environments, but where where the lower density materials such as PICA or AFCO weren't applicable, they couldn't manage the heat flux and pressure. And where Pioneer Venus, the carbon phenolic used there was just not mass efficient um, you know, or, or even mass feasible at, at some points. And so we needed a material that was sort of a mid density, uh, mid thermal conductivity that could, that could hit this sweet spot, this TPS gap that we had identified. Um, we go to the next slide. And so, so how do we hit that? Um, and, and it was sort of this 3D weaving that gave us the ability to, to tailor a material to fit into that gap that was missing there. Um, and what I mean by a 3D weaving is we were looking at 3D layer to layer type weave. So rather than just having fibers go one over one under in different planes, and then you would stack them up like typical graphite epoxy or the carbon phenolics, where really you're limited then by the adhesive strength between those, which during an entry mission chars and becomes very weak. Uh, we were trying to look at a way to improve that inner laminar strength uh, and, and, and resistance to spallation and things like that, um, but also be able to sort of uh, tailor the properties of it. Um, and so what we came up with is a dual layer type structure um, where the outer mold line is what we call the recession layer. That's, that's exposed to the environment. That's managing the recession that you're seeing there. And we wove that as a high density, all carbon fiber weave. Um, it had a relatively fine toe size so that we were concerned with roughness augmentation to the heating that you can see during reentry. Uh, and you would only weave that and design it to the thickness that was required to manage the recession. All right. Um, and so it would be of comparable density to carbon phenolic, for instance, um, maybe even a little bit higher. Um, but in order to, to manage the overall mass, then we had it, uh, a second layer, what we called the insulation layer, which was managing the heat load. So it's lower density. It's made of a blended carbon and phenolic stretch broken yarn. So it has lower thermal conductivity. Uh, and it's basically, you would size that then to uh, allow you to cool it off so that you could bond it to the structure um, there. And so then you could weave these two different layers at different thicknesses, depending upon the mission that you were um, targeting. Um, now, these aren't two layers that are separately woven and then stacked on top of each, each other and bonded together, because then you would have the same issue you had with 2D carbon phenolic or the like. Rather, they're integrally woven. They're mechanically interlocked. You're dropping some of the fibers from the recession layer into the insulating layer and vice versa. Um, and so, so then you've got your woven part, and then we do a phenolic loading uh, infusion, um, similar to what's done with PICA, but a higher, higher amount of phenolic uh, to, to, give, to give you a matrix. Um, but at the end of the day, this is still a, a material that has open porosity, so it's not fully dense. Uh, if we go to the next slide. Um, so we recognized early on um, there was going to be limitations in the size of the parts we could weave. Um, we were we were developing, uh, working with, with our vendors um, to put in place a new loom to support this type of weaving at this scale for the dual layer. Uh, and so, you know, um, we were going to be limited in the size. And so for any reasonably sized vehicle, we were going to have to have a series of tiles in order to cover it, um, the, the heat shield. Um, and, and the mission mission phases or fish missions we were looking at were anywhere in scales from about one meter-ish upwards to three and a half meters, say, for a Venus lander type mission. Um, and, and really, from a lot of our experience through Orion, we recognized early on that the seams between these tiles were going to be by far the most challenging part of our development aspect of this. Um, the seams have two primary functions. Uh, one is aerothermal. All right, so it's got to survive the reenter environment. 
Um, but the other is, is structural, right? Um, the tiles are going to be pretty stiff. They're going to be on the carrier structure. They're going to go along for the ride with the carrier structure. And so that is going to impose some requirements on the seams uh, in order to manage that strain that's there, to provide the strain relief between the tiles. And so that basically we had to put some compliance into the seam material itself uh, and yet have it be as uh, comparably robust aerothermally as the adjacent acreage tiles. Um, and, and so that was, that was a big challenge. Um, and so, uh, you know, through our development efforts, um, you know, aerothermally, we were able to determine things like what's the thickness or width of the adhesive that's used to bond the gap filler in place. Uh, and we did IHF test, we did ARCA testing in the interactive heating facility or IHF at NASA Ames in the three inch nozzle at roughly 3,500 Watts per square centimeter and about five bar of pressure. And that really drove us to a very thin adhesive, right? We were about 10 mil adhesive was required. Uh, larger than that, and this, the gap started to open up um, during the entry environment. Um, and, and we figured out early on, we weren't gonna be able to solve the compliance issue with the seam by just filling it with an adhesive. Uh, if you're familiar with the Mars sample uh, MSL, Mars Science Laboratory or Mars 2020 landers, the heat shields on those use Pika blocks. Between those is put a RTV that was compliant and can manage those stresses between there. RTV wasn't gonna be suitable um, for the environments we were doing here. Uh, and RTV, even if it was in and of itself at 10 mil in diameter, it wasn't gonna be at the, the widths that were required uh, for uh, these entry environments. So we had to work out uh, a more compliant gap filler system. Uh, we're going to go to the next slide. Okay, so one of the key parts we wanted at the end of this, because the our goal was mission infusion to be able to support those Discovery and New Frontiers missions, is we wanted to put in place the industrial base to support the future mission of building this heat shield. We weren't going to make the parts in-house. Ames NASA's responsibility wasn't to do manufacturing for the missions. We were doing some of the technology development and then transfer that. Uh, um, or work with vendors to develop it uh, and prepare it for mission infusion. Um, and so that started back to working with uh, vendor shape technologies in uh, France on how to do the blended yarn we wanted. So getting the carbon and phenolic blended yarn to a suitable form that could be woven. Uh, we worked with Bally Ribbon Mills and Bally PA uh, to do the weaving. So um, scaled up the loom in arc infrastructure they had available. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more of that. And then worked with Fiber Materials Inc. and Biddeford, Maine, uh, in terms of how how are you going to prep the samples and form them prior to infusion and the final machining. Uh, we in, developed in-house um, what we call the heat softening process, which was used to make those compliant gap fillers. And then we were technology transferring that to Fiber Materials Inc. Um, and so the way we demonstrate the success of that sort of technology transfer and development um, with, with our external partners was to build a one meter, what we called an engineering test unit or ETU, which was basically a Saturn probe. Um, and so we, we've, we had our vendors produce the materials for those, and then we assembled them ourselves uh, at NASA Johnson Space Center. And fortunately at the time, at the beginning of the project, we didn't know the solution for the seams and the integration is so tightly coupled with the seam design that we weren't able to do that um, uh, for uh, uh, tech transfer that to industry yet. We had to demonstrate it ourselves, which was part of the incentivization that then showed up for the New Frontiers and Discovery AOs, where uh, we would work with the missions to ensure that we tech transferred um, the integration process to whatever prime contractor they were using. Uh, if we go to the next slide. All right, so I'll try to just run through the different steps. Um, you know, with Bally Ribbon Mills, we then sort of evolved um, the, the material weaving scale in two phases. Uh, when we started off in some of that early work in 2011, 2012, that showed on the first chart, we were weaving about one inch thickness by six inch width. All right, we recognize that's not going to be suitable. Um, too many tiles and not thick enough for some of the applications we were looking at. So we had to scale up initially to about um, two inches or so thickness of the weave and about 13 inches of width. 
Um, and that was roughly about 0.6 inches was the recession layer, 1.5 inches was the insulation layer. Um, but even at 13 inch width, that's a lot of tiles if you're talking a three and a half meter um, heat shield. So we did a second stage of our phase of weave infrastructure upgrade so that we could get to the point of being able to weave 24 inch wide tiles. And there's kind of an image of the 24 inch loom there to give you perspective in the warp direction for the weave. There's about 48,000 warp yarns. So they're managing the pos accurate positioning of all 48,000 of those yarns throughout the weaving process. Uh, if we go to the next slide. Um, okay, so, so the next part was working with FMI on um, the rest of the fabrication. So we're weaving a flat weave. We've got to form that to the shape that we want. So the curved tile shapes on the heat shield do a, a resin infusion to get that phenolic in there. Um, you know, you pull out your infused part and then do the final machining. Um, and there was a lot of uh, uh, requirements on the final machining uh, in order to get uh, proper size of the tiles for integration, as well as for the gap fillers for getting them integrated into the parts. And so we, we worked with FMI to, through those processes and they successfully manufactured the acreage tiles and gap fillers for the ETU. Uh, did an excellent job on that. Uh, and then the next slide. All right, and so then, then as I mentioned before, we worked with Johnson Space Center to do the tile bonding to the structure itself, as well as the integration of the the the, the um, gap fillers themselves. Uh, and we built this one meter base diameter, forty five degree sphere cone engineering test unit. Um, it consists of a, if you look in the picture on the top right, it's got a center nose tile, and then we have two rings, uh, an inner ring of tiles, and then an outer ring of tiles. Uh, one of the things we challenged ourselves to do is we had weave long enough that we could have made this just a nose cap and one ring of tiles. Um, but we recognized that uh, for many of the missions above the about one meter scale, so the Venus landers in particular, would require multiple rings of tiles. And so we wanted to have at least two so that every feature from a seam design, uh, we would have gone and demonstrated the ability to integrate. Um, and, and one of the, the advantages or one of the, the things that came out is our type of seam design is really very scalable. And so even though we only demonstrated this at one meter, it's, it's very directly scalable to larger vehicles such as three meters or three and a half. So we've ended up in the nose cap, two rings of tiles, the gap fillers in between them. Some, and if you look carefully, you can see sort of a, a circular region at the end of all of the circumferential gap fillers, those running in the circumferential direction around that. And that's called a closeout plug. Um, the interface between the ends of those circumferential gap fillers was very difficult to manage. And so we developed a process for putting in a softened closeout plug uh, to manage some of the tolerance stack up issues there. Um, and you can get some ideas of CT scans between them, um, showing the, the good integration that we achieved uh, between those. Uh, if we can go to the next slide. So, so we have the manufacturing side of it that we had to develop and demonstrate the capability of doing uh, and put in the infrastructure to support manufacturing for mission infusion. Uh, but the next part is we needed to develop and validate the tools that were going to be used for design um, uh, and then and then evaluate for any failure modes that might exist in the system. Uh, and so I kind of look at the aerothermal or arc jet test campaign in two ways. One was develop the tools for uh, sizing the TPS, so how thick you need to do it. So we need to be able to uh, predict the recession that occurs, as well as predict the in-depth temperature response. So we know how thick to make it to get it cool enough uh, to be able to bond onto the structure. And so the top couple of figures are just showing, uh, you know, recession versus runtime on the left-hand one, and then TC traces during a, a arc jet test where we put a plug with TCs at different depths to measure the temperature response over time. Um, and, you know, basically, if you look at the solid blue line or the solid green line and then the dashed ones around that, that can, gives a sense of the uncertainty in the environment uh, within the arc jet. Uh, and you can see that our predicted recessions were pretty close to what we would have expected as, for nominal arc jet environments for that solid blue line or the solid green line. So, you know, we were, we were feeling pretty good there. Uh, we are conservative in, in, order, in our ability to med, predict recession at very high heat fluxes. Again, we were testing at 3,500 watts, 1,900 watts. These are well in excess of uh, 
recent missions such as Stardust or Osiris that's coming back, uh, environments that hadn't been seen since entry missions in the early 70s for Pioneer Venus or early 80s at Galileo. Uh, and so we were the first to test in the new nozzle and the IHF. Well, we were very high shear environments that it can occur during these missions. So we were first to work with AEDC Arnold Engineering Development Center in Tullahoma, Tennessee, and their H3 facility for NASA testing, specifically looking at our materials. Um, and, and then the other part is just looking at failure modes. So we needed to ArcJet test the seams and seam designs to verify that we weren't getting some kind of failure mode there. Some of the pictures shown below or uh, on the left-hand one is a post-test image of an ArcJet test of a one-inch diameter test article that went into the IHF three-inch diameter nozzle. And one of the challenges we have is the scale uh, in order to get to the high heat fluxes that we desire or, or the missions desire we have we can only test small specimens it's just the limits of the physics of the facilities that are available uh, and the same thing on the right was a post test of one of our circumferential seams um, at the AEDC in very high shear conditions about 4,000 pascals much higher than what's seen for lunar return missions or the typical sample return mission um, if we can go to the next slide so we, we developed and validated our aerothermal models uh, for predicting the performance of the system. Then it came into understanding the structural performance of the system and being able to show that we can model that, uh, predict, predict that performance. And so we had a structural test campaign that really had three elements to it. Um, there was the, what we called element level testing, which is basically testing the different layers, recession and insulating layer, getting stiffnesses, allowables from those, performance of the gap filler itself, uh, adhesives that are used in the system to bond the gap filler in place, as well as to bond the material to the composite structure. And we had to design our own composite structure to go in um, a la what you would use for a Saturn mission in order to build our ETU and, and make sure that it was relevant. So we were in essence had a, had a baseline Saturn mission that we were working from and we designed and built com using external vendors a composite structure to put the ETU on. Um, then we did assemble components uh, and we did testing uh, four point bend. A lot of those at NASA Langley, where we'd have a seam where the acreage material bonded to composite, do those at warm temperatures, uh, sub ambient temperatures. Um, those structures, those seam designs have to perform uh, in the aerothermal reentry environment. We can't stick a four point bend fixture in the arc jet. So we did the next best thing uh, and sort of refined a process that had been used for testing seams for MSL, uh, where we were taking a four-point bend fixture and putting it in a laser at the Laser Hardened Materials Evaluation Laboratory in Dayton, Ohio, on Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Um, basically, shine a laser on it, be flexing the sample, use uh, strain gauges and the like to, to measure the response of the material as a function of heating and duration of heating. Uh, and then, you know, uh, we also performed some shock testing on the material to show how robust it was to that. Uh, if we go to the next slide, so we did those in sort of subscale pieces, and then that engineering test unit we 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 manufactured a few slides ago. We put it through its paces, um, and so um, you know we we performed a series of tests, starting with a static pressure test on that. Uh, the ETU had total of seventy nine different strain gauges that were assembled on it. Uh, to measure its response to the different loads we were putting on those, combinations of biaxial and uniaxial ones, some on the recession layer, some on the composite. Um, and then we had some that were actually, we, we had known defects uh, in the system, uh, and we wanted to track whether those defects were changing the response or growing through the time. Um, the static pressure test was basically stick the ETU in an autoclave, pull vacuum on the backside of it, so seal it off, pull vacuum on the backside of it, heat it, and apply pressure from the external. Um, that actual pressure profile across the sample is not bad for comparing to what you would get for an entry. Um, we took it out of static pressure, then we did what we called static point load, which is sort of to the right of the, the boxes in the top, where we would press from the interior of the sample at different regions, deflect the different seams and exercise those and measure the, the strain response of those. We did those at a bunch of locations, then we put it in for kind of a typical thermal vac, hot, cold, under vacuum. Uh, measure the response there, and then we put it back through the static load test again uh, to see if anything had changed as a result of the thermal back, which it didn't. 
Uh, and we had done a full CT scan of the part before we started testing and then afterwards to look to see if any of the defects that we had had changed and they really hadn't. There was enough compliance in the system to manage any of the strains that were induced during loading. Uh, and then, you know, we were obviously comparing our models to what the, for predicting what the strain response would be to what it was. And we actually did a remarkably good job on that. Uh, if we could go to the next slide. So at the end of the day, we needed to do a TRL um, self-assessment. What technical readiness level did we think we had achieved? Um, and so we went through and asked ourselves a series of questions. Had we built a high fidelity prototypes that addressed scaling issues? Yes, because we felt that our seam design and integration approach was directly scalable from the one inch, one meter diameter we, ver we demonstrated to something larger. Uh, did we operate the system in relevant environments? Yes, aerothermally, we did in the arc jets, the best you can do for TPS. Thermostructurally, we did combined loading, flexure tests, uh, and LEML. And structural testing, we did pressure tests, thermal vac, point loads on the one meter ETU, as well as four point bend tests. Um, did our test performance demonstrations agree with analytic predictions? Yes, both aerothermally and structurally. And so we assessed ourselves to be a tier L6 with some limitations or caveats to that. Um, we were saying, hey, we've demonstrated it for roughly two inch up to about two inch thickness. But if your system requires much thicker than that, there's some nuances for seam designs and integration that are key um, that we wouldn't claim TRL6 for. Um, and if your environments require above five bars of atmosphere of pressure, 3,500 watts, maybe 4,000 pascals of shear, you know, we're not TRL6 for that. We haven't evaluated it that. Uh, fortunately, for the missions that we were aware of, um, other than Jupiter, it seemed like we could fit within the two inch sort of the range that we were talking there. Um, but one of the things is we said, they don't don't take our word for it. From the very beginning of the project, we had um, put together an independent review board uh, that was chaired by Bobby Braun um, and consisted of members from the mission centers of JPL, Goddard. So those who are actually going to be implementing these material systems from Johnson Space Center, that's part of the human space flight, so has a lot of EDL experience from NASA Langley that has a lot of EDL experience. Uh, ourselves and and elsewhere. Um, and this independent review board we'd meet with about two, three times a year. They could give us some insight into where we were coming up short, where we need to refocus uh, from a mission implementation perspective since we were technology uh, developers. Uh, and and at the end, we, we showed them what we had and they concurred that we had achieved TRL6 uh, and let SMD know that. Uh, and the next slide. Yeah, are there any questions? Thank you. That was very uh, informational and very informative. Um, so thank you again, everyone, uh, for participating. Uh, we uh, look forward to your interest in these technologies and uh, have a nice rest of your day.